Well, good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? It's the last night. Um, it has been really great being here with you all. Um, and uh, th- thanks for your attentiveness. I mean, I. It's one of those things when you're a speaker, like if someone's looking at you, you kind of just assume they're attentive. So I'm just assuming that you're mostly attentive. And, um, and, but it's also revealing with the, the questions that you've had uh, before and after and during the breaks and stuff. Um, this is a, I just get the feeling that, well, it's evident that this is a church that loves to hear God's word, like lo- loves to dig deep and hear God's word, and also be challenged by it, be pushed by it. And um, so that's been, it makes it really fun for me. So, uh, and it's just a, it's just a blessing. So I'm just, I've just been thanking the Lord for that um, this week. So, um, it's our last night together. Anybody have any questions about any any things that you would like to uh, ask publicly? Or, if not, that's fine. Questions about anything? All right. Well, we're going to look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, please. And um, uh, and we'll be out of here. We'll be done here at 7, 736. I'll shoot for right on 736. <laughs> No promises. I am a Baptist youth pastor, so you know how Baptists do. You know, they just go on and on forever and ever. Uh, I'll try not to do that. Okay. All right. Luke chapter 19. We're going to look at the second part of second half of Luke chapter 19. And um, uh, we're going to talk about the entrance into Jerusalem. Okay? Entrance, the entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, remember in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, there's this turning point in the story that where Jesus starts to head towards Jerusalem, and now he's about to enter into Jerusalem. So oftentimes, and maybe if your Bible has section headings or paragraph headings or whatever, your Bible probably says the triumphal entry, something like that, okay? Um, and... Uh, so, the title of the, this message is Triumph and Tragedy. It's a, it's a Palm Sunday kind of sermon, right? Although in Luke you don't see the palms, but you know what I'm saying. It's a Palm Sunday kind of sermon. Triumph and Tragedy. So, we're going to go through a couple of par- or three parts here of this, of this last section the second section of Luke chapter 19, the entrance in Jerusalem, has three parts, in my opinion. And we're going to split it up into three parts. The first part being the triumphal entry. Okay? The triumphal entry. So look with me in chapter 19, and we'll start reading in verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, uh, those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. For all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Verse 28 says that Jesus is headed on into Jerusalem, headed into Jerusalem, finally. This is where Jesus has been heading in the second half of the Gospel of Luke. He's going there. He predicted twice, though, that this is where he's going to be killed by the leaders of this city. So here he is. This is where he's headed, and this is where he's going to die. Jesus has been teaching things contrary to the rulers of the Jews, and these rulers are going to kill him. This is what we have in mind when we come to this passage when we're reading through the Gospel of Luke. This makes the entrance into the city a pretty dramatic entrance. As you just, we just read, it's pretty dramatic. And in our minds, we're thinking, he's about to die, but he's being presented as a king. He is ready to meet his fate in Jerusalem. He goes right for it. And the first thing that he does here is to direct his disciples. He directs his disciples' actions. He immediately demonstrates exactly who is in control of this. See that? He's in control. He's in control of about what's going to happen. And there's language similar to this later on in the Gospel of Luke. Do, does anybody know where we see this language again, where he, Jesus says, go on ahead, this is what it's going to be like, and set things up? Does anybody remember what's this, what, what, what is that from? The Last Supper. Yeah, good. That's exactly right. The Last Supper. So it happens again. Um, so, uh, um, imagine this though, imagine this with me. He's telling him, go into the village, you're going to find a colt. No one's ever ridden on this colt. You're going to find a colt, untie it and bring it to me. And if anybody asks you, hey, hey, why are you, why are you taking that colt? Just tell him the Lord has need of it. Can you imagine if you were one of the disciples hearing that, thinking, okay, this, and this is going to work? Like, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to find this colt. And it, you can just see them, like, awkwardly walking up to it, like, real slow. And like, please, help, this is the cult. You know, they grab the cult, and they're like, hey, why are you taking that cult? And the Lord has need of it. <laughs> and they just go, and it works. And, but this is to demonstrate. When this happens, it demonstrates, and it's reiterated uh, right before the, the, the Last Supper, the institution of the Lord's table, Passover, right before that, um, it's the same kind of thing. And what does it show? It shows that Jesus is in control of this. He knows exactly what's going to happen, and he's in control. Total control, and the total control is confirmed. Whenever you see something like this happen in the scriptures, Jesus spells out, do this, this, and this, and the author says, this, this, and this happened. The point is that he's in control. The author could have just said, um, you know, Jesus said, do this, this, and this, and then it all happened, and then move on. But he takes the time to pen that out. You understand? He's saying this is exactly what happened. He reiterates those things to demonstrate he's in control. He's in control. Jesus is in total control. Then some of his disciples, they put their cloaks on, an, on the animal as a saddle, some disciples to decide to put their cloaks on the ground for the animal to, to walk on. The palm branches aren't mentioned here. They're mentioned in Matthew and Mark. Um, but Jesus is getting, in effect, the red carpet treatment. The whole multitude of the disciples were rejoicing. Not, not just the twelve. The whole multitude is rejoicing. The crowds that have been following him, who have decided to follow him are rejoicing. They're rejoicing and praising God with a loud voice because of all the mighty works that they've seen Jesus do. God do through Jesus. They're praising God. Seems good. Look at what the disciples say. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Jesus is the king and he comes in the name of the Lord. He brings peace and he receives all the glory. What, what a moment this is. 
as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Everybody is rejoicing, all of his disciples. They rejoice that he has arrived in this religious center of their world. It's interesting to note that what they say is an allusion to Psalm 118. I'm just going to mention this briefly. If you want to look at that uh, later, that um, I think that would be interesting for you to think through. Jesus uses this psalm in 118 in Luke 13:35. If you're writing things down, Jesus uses Psalm 118 in Luke 13:35 to lament Jerusalem's failure to respond to him. And now the disciples are using that psalm to praise Jesus because of the mighty works God has done. I think there's some irony there. Because we're not quite sure if the disciples actually understand what's going on. This rejoicing is short-lived. The Pharisees try to break this up pretty quick. The Pharisees see this happening and they're like, okay, this has got to stop. They should not be honoring this man who has been saying things that are contrary to what we're saying, that has, has been against what we're saying. They should not be saying this. So they say to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. It's interesting that they don't give reasons why because they think it ought to be obvious to Jesus. Opposition to Jesus comes immediately upon his entrance, immediately. And Jesus' response is, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. He's saying, I'm not the king because these people say that I'm the king. I'm the king by nature. This is who I am. I am the king. And if people don't recognize it, the natural world does. So if you shut these people up, you can't shut up these stones. They will rejoice at my coming. So Jesus responds in two ways here, and that's the first way. The first way is Jesus responds by correcting the Pharisees. Correcting the Pharisees. He corrects the Pharisees' theology, telling them, in essence, that he really is the king, and he really is to be worshipped and honored above all above all. He's demonstrating that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. The second way Jesus responds, first is he corrects the Pharisees' theology there, corrects the Pharisees, and the second way he responds is is that he weeps. And this is why it's also a tragic entry. And one a uh, pastor that would always call it the tragic entry. Because from the divine perspective, Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Jesus, the God, the Son of God, God the Son, he enters and he says, and, and he weeps. You see that? Look at the next verse. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. It's, it's, it's kind of confusing. What, why is Jesus weeping? He has a whole multitude of disciples. Whatever that means, it means a lot. A lot of disciples rejoicing and praising God for the things that he's done, Jesus has done. Is he weeping because of the opposition of the Pharisees? This, this doesn't sound right. doesn't sound like Jesus. Opposition comes and Jesus weeps. Is that what's going on here? I, I don't think that's what's going on here. Because of what he says, he weeps over the city in verse 42, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Connect that word peace to what, G, what the people said. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Let me read that again. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear, down, tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. He weeps over the city. Why? Why does he weep over the city? Because they really don't understand who he is. They don't understand peace. They don't understand who Jesus is as he, as he comes into the city. They're about to be destroyed and punished for what they're about to do. One commentator says this, these are the tears of one who knows that the people have already turned their backs on God's messenger. Much like a parent watching a child make a foolish decision. Jesus mourns a city sealing its fate. So connect that. Have, have you ever grieved like that as a parent? Or a grandparent? Or a brother? Or a sister? Seeing someone that you love that maybe you've even poured into. A brother and sister in Christ that you, you're like, but you know the truth. See that person make a wrong decision, significant, significantly bad decision, it seems like. I thought you knew. Why now do you deny Christ? I'd venture to say probably most all of us have had that. And that, that is tough. That's hard. I mean, it doesn't take long in ministry and serving in discipling for something like that to happen. And it's difficult. And that's the sense that is, is being portrayed here. His people are about to do something terrible and something terrible is about to happen to them. So he weeps because they don't really understand who he is and because they have no idea what's about to happen there. Some have no idea that he's even there as he enters the city and looks over it. All these people are praising his, him, his name and he goes over, looks at the city and he looks at it and says, a lot of people don't even know I'm here, let alone who I am. Some actually oppose him. Some call him king and are, ex are expecting him to take over the city by force on some military endeavor. That's the general expectation. That he's going to come and he's going to take the city by force. Now, this is why Jesus weeps. They don't get it. The city is about to be destroyed and seemingly no one understands. No one understands why he is there. The triumphal entry quickly turns into a tragic entry. No one understands why Jesus has come. Why is he there? Why is he there? We've seen it predicted in chapter 9. We saw it twice when we were in chapter 9. He's there to die, and he's there to be raised. He's there to die on the cross, be killed by the religious leaders in, in this city, but he will be raised. So the city as a whole has no idea. They either don't comprehend what's happening, or they're just ignorant of what's about to happen, or they're openly hostile. So Jesus goes where? To the temple. He goes to the temple, and he goes to the temple to teach. The word needs to get out. Part three, correction at the temple. Look at verse 45. And he entered the temple 
and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do. For all the people were hanging on his words. Jesus enters, weeps over the city because they don't get it, so he goes to the temple to teach. He teaches daily. These people need to know. They need to know what's going on here. So the first thing he does, though, is he cleanses it so he can teach all the people. And then he starts to teach. And the correction is this. People were apparently sinfully robbing people through the things that they were selling in the temple. Whatever exactly was happening there, they were sinfully robbing people. That's the issue. So, Jesus quotes Isaiah 56, 7. My house shall be a house of prayer. And the people, God's people, have decided to rob people, and that's sinful no matter where you are but especially when there's another specific spiritual purpose for that location, and this purpose is commanded to them in the Old Testament, Isaiah 56, 7, and they know the Old Testament well, they're reading the Old Testament, and he says, my house shall be a house of prayer. We're gonna come back to that statement when we just pull out some application. My house shall be a house of prayer prayer and so he teaches daily in the temple the chief priests and scribes principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him they didn't find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words it's it's just interesting to see as you've probably seen throughout luke and you're going to see it more pointedly here towards the end that the pharisees the religious leaders are unwilling to do certain things because they fear who man Kind of, let's just go with the crowd, and if the crowd says no, we're going to follow the, follow the crowd. They don't stand on the conviction of what God has said. They're just here. What does the crowd want? What does the crowd want? Okay, we have our desires, but we can't move on our convictions because of the crowd. And they could turn on them, but apparently Jesus isn't afraid of them or the crowd. So, as we move towards the end, I'm going to go over this last part of Luke quickly. The rest of the book, basically. Jesus is going to teach and preach the gospel. Luke chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, by the way, buckle up. This is going to be fast. Okay. Jesus is going to teach and preach the gospel. That's what Luke chapter 20 verse 1 says. On one day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes and elders came up and said to him, tell us, by what authority do do you do these things? Or who is it that gave you this authority? So he goes on to teach. The chief priests and the scribes will try to trip him up constantly by asking him questions about paying taxes. Who should I pay tax? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Should we do that? The Sadducees will try to trip him up by asking questions about the resurrection, and he will silence them all. Look at verse 26 of chapter 20. 26 of chapter 20, very end. At his answer, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Look, skip to verse 40 of chapter 20. For they no longer dared to ask him any questions. They're coming to trip him up, and he silences them. Then... Jesus then teaches about the the coming difficulty for believers and for the world at large. It's going to be difficult. Calling believers in chapter 21 to watch yourselves, verse 34, and to stay awake, verse 36, praying that you may have strength. You see that? Difficulty's coming. Jesus experienced that right when he came into Jerusalem. And he's like, just so you know, difficulty is coming for you who follow me. And difficulty is coming for the world. So stay awake. Watch yourselves. Praying, praying that you may have strength. Chapter 21, verse 36. Then the plot to kill Jesus 
unfolds, it intensifies. Satan shows back up. Remember him from chapter 4? Satan shows back up, and he enters Judas, one of the 12. Jesus celebrates the Passover and institutes the Lord's Supper right after that. Right after this happens, Satan enters Judas, and there's like this pause, Passover, Lord's table. At the Lord's table, he says, that his body is given for you. His blood is shed for you. That's what he's telling his disciples. And then he says, the betrayer is among us. And you know what the disciples start to do? They start to argue about who's the best. You can see that happening, can't you? Can you just picture that? Like, Jesus says, the betrayer is, am- is among us right now. Well, it's not me. Is it you? No, it's not me. I mean, look what I've done. <laughs> I've done this, this, and this. Me and Jesus are pretty tight. But no, what, but you've seen what I've done, right? I've done this, this, and this. And you can see how that can quickly, they lose what Jesus has just, just told them. I'm about to die for you. My, my body is going to be given for you. Emphasis there on the for you. And my blood is about to be shed for you. And the disciples are like, but I'm pretty awesome. That seems so silly that we would be so worried about our awesomeness. When Jesus has died for our sins, so prideful and so concerned about their status, so Jesus goes to pray. In agony, he prays. He sweats drops of blood as he prays and says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Chapter 22, verse 42. If you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Have you ever, have you ever thought about that statement? Does it sound like he's, he's trying to get out of it? You ever compared Jesus' prayer to like, the martyrs from the Reformation as they sing praises when they're being burned at the stake. And Jesus is praying in agony. Not my will, but yours be done. But you know what the big difference between what Jesus is about to face and what these martyrs have faced? Martyrs don't have to bear the wrath of God. Jesus bears the wrath of God. Then, after Jesus gets up from his prayer, he says the betrayer is here. He, his betrayer arrives. Jesus is arrested. His close friend, Peter, denies him three times, even though Peter had just promised that he would go with Jesus to prison and even to death. He says that in chapter 22, verse 30, 33. Jesus is mocked and appears before leaders no less than three times, and no guilt is found. But the people cry out, crucify, crucify him, chapter 23, verse 21. 23, 21, crucify, crucify him. And it says, they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So, Jesus is hung on a cross to die with criminals, being mocked by all who stood by. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus dies. Jesus is buried, but three days later, he rises again. And if we believe that this is true, if we believe that that is true, God makes us alive. If we believe that Jesus has died, bore the wrath of God, 
taken the sins of man, if we believe that that's true, and that he has risen from the grave in accordance with the scriptures, we're made alive, though once dead, made alive. Colossians 2. Listen to this from Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Do you you see that courtroom scene? Do you see that? He has forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with legal demands. So in other words, we have a debt to pay our sins. And that, all bundled together, stands against us and demands something legally. What is it that it demands? It demands hell. It's saying, in effect, go to hell. For real. Go. And Jesus dies for that. He cancels that record that stood against us with legal demands. That's what it demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It is finished. The debt has been paid in full. So, believe today. If you have not decided to be a follower of Jesus, he has died for your sins. Believe today. Trust in him. Decide to follow him and him alone with your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, trust him daily. Let him speak to you through the triumphal, tragic entry. Let's pull out a couple of points of application from Luke chapter 19. Number one, weep over the spiritual condition of your neighbors. We've talked about this a little bit, especially last night. Do you see see what I'm saying when I say, like, have a Christ-like view? This is what I mean. Christ looks at a city and weeps because they don't understand God's plan and his plan for all people. So do we have this kind of concern for people that they would come to know Jesus? That they would understand the gospel? And find joy in Christ. We hit a lot on on that last night, so I won't just hit that point of application. But don't only weep for unbelievers. Weep for the sin that you see in your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're in a body, right? We're in a body. Our brothers and sisters are counting on us. We, We grow together in unity, in community. And because we love Jesus, because we love God, we hate sin, right? We naturally, we should hate sin. Hate it enough, though, to deal with it in your own life, like we talked about in Luke chapter 4, when, when we're tempted, deal with it in our own lives. We hate sin. But also, hate it enough to talk to your brother and sister about it. Hate it enough in your own life Get help from people. Let the body help each other so that it builds itself up in love. Ephesians chapter 4. But I hate it enough to confront, to speak the truth in love, to confront a brother or sister in Christ. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. And it's also hard to hear when someone confronts me. So, and it's, it's hard because um, the person confronting, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And 
that person may not be very good at it. Might be too abrasive sometimes. Might be maybe even a little bit, seemingly a little bit cocky in that. But it might just be because they don't do it often. I mean, has anybody ever felt that way when they were confronted by somebody? I get confronted by teens sometimes. And my natural response is like, okay, nice try. But it's like, what I, but really, like, okay, I really want to listen to what they have to say. What is it that they have to say? And take it seriously. And so one, one time a girl came to me and said, I just really think you're being um, just kind of a, a jerk to one of the guys in the youth group. And me and that guy are like really close. And I can see how that can be a, be a perception. So, I, so, and I'm thinking, no, 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 we're, we're fine. But it's just like, okay, thank you for that. Calm down, Paul. And, okay, yep, thank you, thanks. And so I, then I go to that guy and say, hey, just so you know, I, I want to ask you, like, really seriously. Like, am I being too hard on you? Like, I, you know, I, here's what I said tonight and kind of in front of everybody. Was that okay? If it, I, I, if it was, like, maybe a little bit, like, tell me. Even if it was, like, a little bit hurtful, I don't want to do that at all. Um, maybe it was a little bit hurtful and you just got over it real quick and it was fine, no big deal. But just tell me. Let's, let's get down to it. So like when you're, when you're conf- confronted about something, just give grace to that person. Like, just be like, yeah, thanks. Or when um, you're confronting somebody, that ought to make us think, okay, how can I do this carefully? H- have I taken the log out of my eye? Is that issue? Have I taken that log out of my eye? Am I currently, if I'm currently working on this thing and dealing with it, getting that out of my eye, um, then, I, then I'm going to, I can go and help. And it's because we, we hate sin. We weep over sin that we see, the spiritual condition of a brother or sister. Um, in the counseling room, se- se- uh, session one, um, I like to hit on the fact that you've, just for an example, you've not only sinned against your spouse, You've sinned against God. And that's actually way more serious. You've sinned against my God. This is why I explain. You've sinned against my God, and that's why I am all in to help you. I want my God to be honored in your life and not dishonored. So I, I want to help. I'm all in. And we, this is the way we ought to be thinking Normally, I, I can't wait to help because I want God's name to be honored and not sinned against. Can't wait to help somebody work through a difficult issue because I love God and because I love them. Love God, love neighbor. So, do we care about the spiritual condition? of the neighbors that we have right here in this body? Do we really care about them? Do we really care about each other? So pursue each other. Do it. Pursue each other. Open up to each other. Help each other. On an island by ourselves, we starve. But in a body, we grow. Make sense? On an island, we we starve ourselves, but in a, on, in a body we grow. We grow together. Um, your growth has an effect on the body. Your lack of growth has an effect on the body. So we, we help each other. We're all we're a team. We're in this together. We want to honor Christ in all these things. So be concerned about, I put weep over your neighbor's spiritual condition. Be concerned about the spiritual condition of others, whether they're unbelievers or believers. Number two, pray. Pray. Jesus says, as he quotes Isaiah, my house shall be a house of prayer. 
we ought to be a people who pray. Why didn't Jesus say that his house should be a house of singing? Why didn't Jesus say, my house shall be a house of teaching? My house should be a house of preaching. My house shall be a house of doctrine. But he says, quoting Isaiah, my house shall be a house of prayer. Really? Prayer. Why does he quote Isaiah in this text? Now, there's questions, obviously, concerning how this, this scene in the temple ought to translate into the body of Christ, the church gathering today. There's questions. Does, does it, is there a one-to-one correlation there, or how do we think through that? Because the temple life was different than church life, different. Something different happening there. But whatever you decide here, however you work through that and decide here, don't miss the forest through the trees, right? What's the point? We ought to be a people who pray together. Um, one uh, pastor I was reading and listening to on this text um, had some really helpful thoughts on prayer. And uh, I've taken his thoughts here and morphed them just a little bit, uh, but just they're not all, these aren't all my ideas here. Really helpful things. And here, here's what he says. He gives, he gives three real practical, helpful things we think through this. Um, he says, set a time and don't leave it to chance. Number one, set a time, prayer, to pray, and don't leave it to chance. It, it, it's, it's not evil that keeps us from praying normally. A lot of times it's good things that keep us from praying. Um, pick a time, pick a place, and show up. For me, the morning is the best time. Before the kids get up, that's the best time for me. If I, if I leave it for the evening, man, I'm so tired, and it's like, yes, I always pray with my mouth open. <laughs> <I'm saying. laughs> um, so pick a time and play. Don't, set a time. Say, I'm going to pray. That's what I'm going to pray. I'm, I'm going to do that at that time. Number two, take, take what you're reading in the Bible and turn it to, into prayer. Take what you read in the Bible and turn it into prayer. It's just that easy. We may easily get sidetracked in our prayers, but turn the Bible into prayer. I love it. Um, uh, occasionally, uh, we do a scripture reading in our, every Sunday in, in our uh, congregation, in our corporate gatherings. And normally what we do is during the scripture reading and the pastoral prayer, the, the person praying prays through that text. And I've just found that to be really helpful for me as I think about how do I pray after reading the text. And to, to do that, read, read your, it makes sense that you would read the Bible as God talks to you and that we would respond in prayer to him. Number three, um, pray, this has been really helpful for me, pray for different categories each day of the week. Uh, the pastor words it a uh, more confusing way, at least confusing for me. Uh, pray for different categories of each day of the week. So suggestion, like, okay, Monday I'm going to pray for this. Tuesday I'm going to pray for this. Thursday I'm going to pray for this. Uh, did I skip one? Wednesday. Thursday I'm going to pray for this. Whatever. Okay, Friday. And uh, Saturday I'm just going to leave that to something else, a Sunday to something else. Uh, but you just think, like, if there's some people that I probably wouldn't pray for unless they were on my list. wouldn't pray for them regularly. So maybe Monday is extended family. Tuesday, maybe Tuesday is uh, leaders in your church, missionaries. Um, maybe Wednesday it's parents and grandparents in the church or neighbors. Thursday, maybe it's other churches in our area. Friday, 
the socio-political world that we live in. Every day, Abby, Vale, Pillar, Zeke, and Amos. But come up with your own. Maybe that's helpful for you. You think I'm going to write down what I'm going to pray for each day of the week and pray. So where are we on prayer? Is it just quick prayers before meals? Quick prayers before a tough meeting? Quick prayers of thank you before bed? And those are all fine. Those are all good things to do. The devil makes us think that it's legalistic to pray at a regular time. Don't let him deceive you here. It only becomes legalistic when we demand others to do the same. Does that make sense? We judge them, and we talked about the other day, we judge them spiritually because they're not meeting our mark that we have set up. That's where it becomes sinful. But for us to do it on a regular basis, that's not sinful. Don't think, oh, that's legalism if we do that every single... No, it's not. Do we think it's worth it to meet with others to pray? Is it awkward to pray with other believers outside of the church building? Is it awkward to pray with your kids or your grandkids? I hope not. Has your marriage relationship become so strained that you don't even pray together? So where are we on our prayer? And oftentimes we think, we wonder, why is my faith so weak? Um, uh, John Piper says something along these lines. Is it our duty to do this? Is it just about being disciplined and pulling up our bootstraps to get this done? He says it ought to be our delight to pray. But he says it's a duty, though, the way that it's a duty for a scuba diver to put on his air tank before he goes underwater. He says it's a duty the way soldiers in combat load their guns and put on body armor. It's a duty the way hungry people eat food and thirsty people drink water. Duty? Delight. He says, to close that out, if you don't pray, you won't live. Pray to demonstrate our dependence on him. He's in control. Remember that? He has everything planned out. He's in control. Pray that you would submit to his will, like we saw Jesus in the garden. Pray. Pray hard. Pray more. Make time to pray. But I'm, I'm too busy to pray. <laughs> and uh, John Piper says this. Uh, I, I, this is a really convicting quote. He says, one of the great uses of Facebook and Twitter will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from the lack of time. Make sense? We need to get on our knees and pray. Um, let me conclude with this, this quotation from, uh, did, do, you guys, do you guys know about uh, Secret Church? Ever heard of this? Secret Church that David Platt puts together every uh, uh, springtime. And um, he, well, anyways, it's like a six hour of teaching from the word. And this year, uh, we were unable to attend for the first time in a long time. But uh, this year, he, in 2019, he did, uh, secret church on teaching on prayer, fasting, and the pursuit of God. And as, as we finish up here, I'll read this quotation for us uh, from, this is from like the promo video for it. If you saw that, you'll, you'll recognize these words. I just typed them out as I listened to them. Uh, but I thought them to be really helpful as, as we think through prayer in this text. When God's people begin to call out for him, he will often wait to see if they really want what they're asking for. The greatest, um, 
way to the spread of the gospel is the greatest hindrance, sorry, the greatest hindrance to the spread of the gospel is not the self-indulgent immorality of our culture, but it's the self-sufficient mentality of the church. Can I read that again? The greatest hindrance to the spread of the gospel is not the self-indulgent immorality of our culture, but it's the self-sufficient mentality of the church. We're okay without God. He goes on, only God is able to do the work of God. Why is it that you and I spend hours every week in our church devoted to the ministry of the word while we spend minutes every week in the church devoted to the ministry of prayer? God, in his providence, has chosen to make prayer a powerful means by which we interact with him and effectively shape the course of history. Do not underestimate the role of desperate prayer. Plead for God's mercy upon sinners. Plead for God's glory on the earth. Keep on pleading until the day when Scripture promises that we shall see him face to face. Pray. Pray. Plead with him. So, what's our mindset? Where's our heart? I've seen services here and prayer is happening. When there's a time, I don't have the agenda in front of me, there's a time when somebody gets up and prays. Is it like this? Like, man, this is the guy that prays for a long time. (laughs) Something going on with this one? (laughs) Or is it... um, (laughs) That's an interesting reaction. Thank you for that. (laughs) Or is it focused in? I want to think through. One benefit of hearing other people pray is that it teaches me how to pray better. It's like, man, I, I really like the way you worded that. I need to grab onto that. That's really helpful for me. To know how to pray better as we corporately pray together? Is it, no, I want to, or after Pastor Paul gets done preaching, is the prayer time the pack-up time? Oh, sweet, we're done. My purse, my backpack, you know, everything set up. <clears throat> Clear my throat, and it's, okay, we done here? get my hymnal out and kind of guess which one is going to, I don't know how this works, but um, of course I'm over-exaggerating. I didn't see that on Sunday, just so you know, I'm not pointing anybody out, but, um, but how, where's our mind? Where are we, where's our mindset? We're really praying together. But also, the church gathering together to pray is not just about, and it's an important piece. Sunday morning is an important piece but it's not just about Sunday morning gathering to pray. Do we pray with and for each other? Um, Do we have people into our homes and pray with and for them? That's convicting for me. That is something I need to be better at. is having brothers and sisters in my home and praying with them. Um, because sometimes we, we can easily, I think, get into this mentality. That happens on Sunday morning when we gather. And what happens out there is it's not really church. We're the church. And we gather and we pray. I hope, I hope that's something more and more comfortable for us. So be concerned about the spiritual condition of your neighbors, of our neighbors, and pray. 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 And the really awesome thing about praying to God is he's a good father who loves to give good gifts to his children. So we pray with hope and confidence. Knowing 
that no matter how he answers, he does so for my good, for his glory. And I just pray that I would submit to his will, whatever it is. I give him my desires. Here's my desires. You're, um, and Mark, uh, Jesus says, Abba, Father, you can do all things. Remove this cup from me, but not my will. Yours be done. So, why don't we pray? Dear God, thank you for the conviction that this text brings. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate with these brothers and sisters in Christ the death and resurrection of your son. Thank you for the opportunity to go through Luke together. Thank you for sending your son so that though we were dead, you made us alive by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This you set aside, nailing it to the cross. And we rejoice. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die and to rise. Lord, we, we need to be better at selflessness, at de- denying ourselves, and not being so concerned with our own interests, but also the interests of others. So much so that we would pray with and for each other, that we would weep over the sinfulness of others. Not just ours. Yes, ours, but others. So, Lord, give us strength in this. Give us wisdom to know what to say to people as we talk with them about things that we see in their lives we confront on sin issues. Give us grace and kindness. Give us humility in those times as well. And even as we are, as we are confronted because we're all sinners, help us to receive that graciously. We need your help because naturally we're defensive. Um, And Lord, help us to be people who pray, who are characterized by prayer, knowing that you're a good God and love to give good gifts to your children. Help us to devote time to be praying to you. Help us to get up early or get on our knees before bed and to pray. Help us to be praying with each other, our spouses, friends, because we're body and we want you to be honored in the body. Lord, grant wisdom. Give us strength as we go from this time. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we've got to spend together these last few days. What a blessing has been uh, to me. And I just ask that we've been challenged in a lot of different areas by your word. Give us remembrance. Help us to take your word seriously and to take sin seriously and to choose to believe and to follow you in these things. Lord, bless Abingdon Bible Church as they move forward and they seek your will 
as they pursue people in the, this community that your name would be honored in this church, your name would be honored in these neighborhoods, and through your work in this church, your name would be honored among all nations. So Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of Abingdon Bible Church, the leadership, the people. So we ask your blessing upon them. And it's with gratefulness in our hearts that we pray in Jesus' name, amen.